Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I thank the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Korea for her leadership in holding this conference. And it is an honor to join Nadia Murad and Dr. Dennis McQuaige, who speak with such moral authority and experience on this issue. I want to begin by acknowledging the many women who are imprisoned or under attack for claiming their rights, who would have had every right to speak to you today but cannot. Women prisoners of conscience everywhere. Women human rights defenders killed for exposing corruption. Women murdered for reporting domestic violence. And young girls burned to death for naming their abusers. Shame on any government that incarcerates women for seeking their rights. And shame on anyone who hides behind the notions of religion, culture, or masculinity to justify or cover up violence against women and children. The truth is, a woman's life does not rank equally with a man's far more universally than we are willing to acknowledge. Conflict-related sexual violence is a manifestation of this reality. It seems we believe in rights for women and girls only to a point in our daily lives to the point that it might force us to see something we don't wish to see and have to act upon it. In politics, to the point that it doesn't compete with vested interests. In our foreign policy, to the point that it doesn't conflict with business and trade. At the Security Council, to the point that a P5 member chooses to cast a veto to shield an ally, no matter how bloody their hands. And in settling conflicts, the rights of women and girls matter to the point that we can declare success and move on. It is this caring to a point that means that gender equality is still at least a century away. That domestic violence has grown sharply worse during the pandemic and that the number of people displaced by conflict and persecution, over half of them women, and children has doubled in a decade. So my question to every government taking part in this conference is this. Do you truly intend to prevent and address sexual violence in all its manifestations, in all contexts, or will you only commit to a point? I say this not to discourage progress, but to invite honesty. Impunity for sexual violence in conflict has got worse, as our willingness to resolve and prevent conflict has weakened. We need to be brutally honest about this. We know what needs to be done. We need to recognize crimes of sexual violence in conflict in all peace and mediation processes, exclude them from amnesty provisions, and hold perpetrators account. We must prioritize and fund sexual violence programs in all conflict and humanitarian settings, including sexual and reproductive health services and protection programs. We must provide comprehensive care for female, male, and child victims including children born of rape, such as health services, safe shelters, and access to justice. We must enable women to participate in all decision-making, including, I would stress, forcibly displaced and stateless women and girls. We have to change military and police training and doctrine and help states to build their own capacity to gather evidence and mount prosecutions. And finally, we must protect, not persecute, human rights defenders. There's nothing new here. Five years ago, over 150 countries endorsed a UN declaration promising to do these things. These are all actions in our power. 
And I urge anyone listening to ask their government what they have done to live up to these commitments. Because half measures will not work. The lack of accountability will lead to more violence and put stability further and further out of reach. Cutting humanitarian aid because of the pandemic, as some governments are reportedly considering, will lead to more movement of refugees and more women and children at risk. It is time to speak the truth about the consequences of our actions or lack of them. Young people, in particular, expect this from us. And most of all, it is what survivors deserve. The bravery of victims of rape who face stigma and retaliation, yet still have the courage to speak out about their experiences and fight for others, demands equal courage from all of us. Above all, it demands courage from those in positions of power and responsibility and a willingness to be honest and humble about the work that lies ahead. For in the end, the only point of all our efforts, the only real measure of success, will be if they lead to change that survivors can see and feel in their own lives. Thank you.